Hi, kitty cats. I am Amethyst Herrick, your hostess for Gender Identity Weekly, a weekly discussion about identity and gender from the contributors and guests of the Purple Paw Publications website, genderidentitytoday.com. This content is brought to you by subscribers of genderidentitytoday.com. If you're already a subscriber, first of all, let me just say thank you for your ongoing support, because you already know that subscribers not only receive new content directly to their inboxes as soon as it publishes, but are also able to interact with every contributor directly, and that includes me, which who wouldn't want to interact with me, huh? So if you would like to support shows just like this one, as well as all the podcasts, videos, and written articles by the rest of our contributors, please consider subscribing using the links you're going to find in the show notes. Well, I am very, very honored and excited to welcome Elsa Blair to the show. Hi, Elsa. Hey, how's it going? You know, I thought it was going to be a crummy day, but looking at your face, do you know how much better it got? I mean, how could it not? It's uh, it's just right? an inevitable, you know. <laughs> it is inevitable. Did that? Um, did was it, is this going to make a better a better interview now? Because now that I've like flattered you a little bit, I help? mean, yeah, I, it's usually slipping me a bit of money as well helps, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I sent you. I sent you five bucks because it was Canadian, but it was Canadian. So. Yeah, so it was worthless, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Poor Canada. Let me finish the rest of the intro. So, Elsa is a neurodiverse, non-binary product designer and research leader, and also founder of the Drag Me mobile app, which connects drag enthusiasts to drag artists. And I was mentioning to you earlier, Elsa, that it do have a little bit of a history in drag. So it will be interesting to, to talk about that a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. But I got to I mean, I look at your background. You have so much background in promoting diversity and, and promoting uh, the queer community. Just, a, I mean, an, an incredible background. And I got to know, like, what was, were there circumstances growing up that, uh, that sort of created this adult Ailsa that's able to, to be quite so open and welcoming and, and promoting diversity? I think, well, I think a lot of it, to be honest, um, stems back to like childhood trauma and people pleasing (laughs) to a degree. Um, but definitely post healing is, is mostly, I felt very isolated and alone growing up in like the small Mm. town next to the city that I I grew up in. Um, I didn't ever feel comfortable being myself. Um, Even when I kind of knew I was queer at 12, that wasn't something that I was really comfortable uh, bringing to the public or attention until I was like way in my 20s. Um, so I think oh, like wow. really, okay. yeah, having that experience and and kind of seeing folks struggle, it, it I'm too empathetic to not want to to do something about it. And tech is just especially so toxic and and very kind of white cis het male driven that um, being able to bring more trans folks, more queer folks into that community is is very much like a life-changing situation when you can go into a, an, an environment that is welcoming for trans folks versus like being very hostile, you know? Yes. Well, yes. Having been transgender in technology, I mean, pre-transition, I mean, I retired from technology. A little part of me, by the way, a little part of me kind of feels badly that I left that all behind so that I can't make any changes in, in technology. It's a little part, not that big of a part. No. Am I going back? No, but don't go back. <laughs> it is really very, it's really very unwelcoming in technology, unless like, except like you said, the cishet white male is, is uh, you know, welcomed. So Yeah, and it's, it's really wild, like having now founded a company and, being, you know, fundraising and, and trying to find investors um, and being trans, it's really, really hard to even get that, like, first initial meeting with folks. Sure. 
Um, it's it's something wild. Like there's only two point five percent of all funding goes to like non men, um, and like Wait, really part of that is like zero point two five percent go to queer folks. That is stunning. Yeah. I can't believe that. That is, wow. I I mean, you could say, well, there are fewer woman founders. There are fewer, you know, queer folks out there. But geez, I mean, that's... Not to that degree, right? Um, No, no. But presumably, I mean, I'm sure you've gotten to work. I was going to say had the privilege of working, but I'm sure you've met the proverbial tech bros and it's I still to this day wonder how do these people ever get funding? Like how do you go to a a venture capitalist just being the guy you are and and walk out with millions of dollars? Because if I were a venture capitalist, I'd be like, you're a wanker. Yeah, so get out of my office. You know. <laughs> yeah, and it's and, and maybe I shouldn't say this because I'm too honest, but. Uh, being at my last company and watching like how that was run um yeah i'd I'd always said that i didn't want to run my own company ever i didn't want to be ceo Mm. that's too much responsibility like i too much pressure um and then when i saw how this was run i was like i could literally do this way better (laughs) why am i not doing that for myself why am i not creating the environment that i want to work in Right. But, but you had brought up empathy, that, that you had empathy, you know, seeing the way that you grew up, you know, yeah. what was all going on around you. Yeah, that empathy is huge. It, actually, I mean, if I can side, side that into a different question, yeah. um, I think that empathy, because you've done a ton of product design as well. Yes. Um, I'm curious if, if the product design, like trying to make trying to make software that works for all people, if that helps fulfill some of this desire for empathy and and to express your empathy. Yeah, I think so. I think also um, I had a a bit of a a strange route into like UX and product design Um, Mm -hmm. at the time that I was getting into it. I ended up helping out uh, our creative director at, at FreshBooks um, with setting up usability testing. And so I ended up getting into product design through like user research, um, which I think helped build that empathy because you have to be that empathetic facilitator, like, um, translator. Um, yeah, I think that probably had a lot to do with it as well. I would imagine you've actually brought up universal design too. And I am nowhere near an expert in this. Can you can do my can we talk a little bit about that? Can you tell us a little bit about universal design? Yeah, absolutely. So um, when you think of like accessibility in design, that that is essentially you going back and correcting something that is not working for someone. When you're practicing universal design, universal design thinks of the full gamut of people first um, and designs for everyone. So we'll include in their user research specifically, you know, neurodivergent folks, queer folks, uh, BIPOC folks, um, and make sure that they have a nice, well-rounded idea of how people approach problems um, Mm. versus like assuming people are going to approach problems all the same and then having to retroactively um, kind of fix or, you know, change something that is not working. Do, can you give me an example, actually? Because I am I think, and maybe this is my, obviously not cis hat, but my white upbringing, it's, it's interesting to, to me to think that there would be a different way of looking at an application can do can you mind give me an, giving an example yeah absolutely um so i think a good example that kind of most uh, designers especially can kind of uh, think about is like color contrast ratio right mm. um and so a lot of people when they're designing their own apps their own websites they don't think about you know the fact that some folks are colorblind um and there is a whole range of colorblindness that you have to account for um so it's not as simple as you just to kind of have to change it to a certain color um so basically 
people go back and retroactively fi fix that in Canada right now because uh, we started a, an accessibility in web law some time oh, ago, really? which came into effect, I think, I want to say 2020, and is still kind of people are catching up to it. Um, so that retroactive fit is happening a lot. Um, universal design would basically dictate, okay, I'm going to talk to everyone, make sure that I'm testing this design before it even goes into production and can be used by like everyone. I want to yeah. make sure that like everyone of all disabilities, of, of all abilities, of, uh, you know, kind of all underrepresented communities can, can use this application in the same way that, you know, white folks can, like cishet folks can. Um, yeah. It's, it's basically just giving user research the the space to be able to do its job properly um, instead of, you know, um, building what you think should be in existence and then going back and having to change things in terms of flows or color ratios. <laughs> right. I mean, I've, I've been asked to design enough, you know, web pages to go, well, you're going to get the engineer, you know, the engineer sort of look on this. Yeah. Which is almost entirely what you get. Because, you know, there's the joke. I think you, you even make the joke on one of your websites that, you know, like user research, QA, like all UX, all of this just goes right out the window. You're like, look, we're out of money. It's, you know, just get a product. Does it work? Fine. You know, and, and that certainly is not universal. So... No. And I mean, it's hard, right? Like you have to have money to be able to do that. You have to have like a yes. good startup capital. And um, even speaking for myself, like I very much bootstrap drag me from the start. Um, I'm, I'm lucky that obviously I'm a designer and there are certain things that I can take into account like right off the bat. Um, and I can make sure the UX is like fairly good straight out of the gate. Um, right. But that's that's not everyone, um, and not everyone can afford to hire that kind of talent right from the offset. Um, so it's hard. It's hard. Like, how do you instill that? Like, how do you um, how do you start making that the norm when it's an expensive norm? <laughs> you know, it is. You know, though, because what is the statistic? It's like nine out of ten software projects fail. Yeah, something like that. Something. Yeah. It's, it was three out of four, you know, four out of five. I mean, it was a very high percentage. And at least some of that has to do with products that come out that aren't usable. Yes. And, and so people look at them because, I mean, I'm, I'm sure everybody listening has done this. I've installed some app on my phone and gone, this is going to be so cool. I can't wait to use whatever the hell it is. Like, I don't even know. And I'll open it up and I'll go. It's like a red button. Why am I looking at this? I don't like this. And I'll just uninstall it right there. Yeah. And I've, I mean, there are, there are applications that just feel wrong. You just open, open them up and you go, what am I even looking at? I don't even want to bother to try and find out. And, and I, I suspect that's cause for many of the, the failures that we've seen in technology. Do you, actually, that's my opinion. Do you, what's I, yours? I, I would agree with that. Honestly, I, I think, um, like having to, to bootstrap and obviously, um, a lot of folks assuming that their experience is the universal experience in the world. Um, yes. They, they create products that they like, don't necessarily work for everyone, like you say, and that, that yeah, it, it means product market fit is just not possible because you only have a very small subset of people that you're targeting. Yeah, yeah. And of course, we, the first thing we do is we go to solve our problem. I think is, is you, you, are, you are saying that in a little bit different way, but yeah. It's always great to see people, you know, like, oh, I got this great idea for a company. And you go, well, what's it going to do? And there's, well, it's going to make this, this, you know, whatever, whatever's hard for me, it's going to make it easier. And you go, does anybody else have this problem? I, I don't know. I mean, do you have this problem? Well, no, I don't. So it was, is this going to be a successful company, you think, if nobody else has this problem? I wish I had an example because that would have been great. 
<laughs> but I didn't. I threw that out there too early. I should have let so, it be. A good example of that, actually, Airbnb had that experience. Really? Um, yeah, they went oh. to, um, from what I've heard from reading uh, medium articles and podcasts, um, sure. They, they obviously went around with a pre-seed deck that was kind of like, you know, this many people are um, couch surfing on Craigslist. This many people are registered for couchsurfer.com. And, mm. and most investors were like, this is just not going to work. Like, no one's going to do this. People like hotels too much. And Airbnb has almost become the norm over hotels at this point. Oh, Yes. Oh, yeah. Hotels have become like you go, oh, dang, I got to stay at a hotel. <laughs> yep. There's going to be somebody next door. I can't believe it. Yeah. Wow. I'm amazed that, that they had trouble raising capital. It yeah. seems hard to believe. Yeah. But, there, there are a few examples of, of kind of those bigger companies that had trouble kind of getting started. But once they found the right investors and, you know, the folks who either believed in them or were in the same industry um, and saw the potential, obviously uh, kind of put their money forth and uh, they got, yeah. got to prove them wrong all those other investors who turn them away which is kind right. of the sweet part right when you when you have that experience you're getting turned away all the time um which very much had again from fundraising um it's it's all the sweeter when you kind of get that win and you're able to yeah. say like look i like y you should have believed in me <laughs> right right i have a i have a question that 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 dovetails into this because i will say, you know, my whole time in, in uh, I'll come out and I'll say it, my whole time in technology, I presented more or less as cishet white man. Yeah. Let me take a moment and I should go get a cup of coffee after having to say something like that. Jesus. Honestly, something. Um, yeah, well, you know. So there were many challenges I don't think I faced. Now, certainly my... I think my feminine nature came through on, in a lot of ways. And I know that that's part of why I bumped heads with, with like the tech bro type guys. Anytime toxic masculinity came up, yeah. it was, I would just fold, you know, cause it's like, never mind. Like, I have no, I have nothing to say against this. So I, I kind of wanted to ask, I mean, I, I don't know that I've fa faced a whole lot of, of challenges. I think certainly with, with my, gender just not my gender presentation do, do you have a, an idea on what's a greater challenge to be a woman in technology or to be transgender or non-binary in technology honestly i i think i i wouldn't i wouldn't feel comfortable saying like one's more like harder than the other i think they're just very different experiences mm. um and I can speak of kind of when I got into tech, I, I was I was mask presenting, but I was very much identifying as uh, a cis queer woman. And that experience getting into tech as a woman was definitely hard. I definitely experienced, you know, like you said, the butting heads against tech bros. Um, yeah. But also at the same time, I think as I transitioned through my career, um, because I, I really started transitioning in 2015 when I got my top surgery, mm. uh, I was able to kind of start becoming even more mask presenting, which I think in some, in some rooms got me a pass for sure. Um, and I feel that sometimes even walking down the street now and being kind of more mask presenting. Right. Um, but also trying to kind of face the tech industry as someone who is trans and non-binary um, is very, very hard um, for kind of the reasons like the funding uh, statistics, because, you know, I have that empathetic nature and I, I want to help people and I want people to go to work and it be a supportive and psychologically safe environment, which apparently right. is, you know, just a wild concept for most people. Um, but that has gotten me in trouble. And, and I think 
I think being kind of trans and, and kind of going through that experience, especially in the tech industry um, and having that empathy, um, it, it definitely kind of dovetailed into, into me wanting to either create an inclusive space as being a product design leader of a team or kind of as, as a kind of founder and CEO now of my own company. Yeah, that that got me in trouble too. By the way, yeah. <laughs> when, when I'm like, you in know, trouble. this doesn't seem I will take that yeah. trouble. <laughs> well, right, exactly. It's the kind of trouble I would want to be in. Yeah, because oh, you know, I was going to make the joke. You know who doesn't butt heads with tech bros? Yeah, I'm a tech bros. <laughs> I'm not even sure if that's true. I'm curious. <laughs> I mean, honestly, if I ever end up talking to another, I'll ask. But but yeah, I mean, you you. You know, you try hard if you're going to make a team, right? You want a team that's going to to be productive, which is you know the the purpose of management anyway is to make work productive. I'm I'm quoting Peter Drucker at this point, but fifty year old Peter Drucker. So it's not like it's a brand new you know concept. Oh. But the idea that that um, that we have people going into founding companies and just thinking, well, these are tools; these are interchangeable faceless, nameless tools. I mean, I, I don't, I struggle to understand like, like how you get into, I mean, it's like, I mean, it's almost, uh, is it sociopathic? I guess is the word. I mean, I, I struggle to think, I struggle to understand that. And presumably you do too. So I think we're probably both just going to yeah. go, yeah, huh. But yeah, it's, it's interesting for sure. It's definitely not the way that I think or work at all. Um, no, no. And you can't be, because otherwise you don't end up with a team that's productive. No. And if you want is a happy team, because typically happy teams are productive teams, not always, but if you want a productive team, I mean, you, there needs to be a sense of belonging a sense of inclusion i think is, is a, yeah i guess it's really i agree used. and i'm i'm especially wary of any company that says that we're a family because no we're not a family like we work together let's let's yeah. be real but we can we can be a collaborative team that enjoys each other's company 40 hours a week or whatever time period we're together um and that can be okay. Like, you know, having a safe, productive environment makes your company better. It makes your yes. team better. It makes your product better. Um, mm -hmm. And I've seen that firsthand just from the way that I've hired, like for my own teams. Oh, sure. Oh, sure. No, I, yeah, I have seen teams go from can't do anything without, you know, four different tickets in JIRA. <laughs> to like taking responsibility for something and going, you know what? I found something. I'm going to clean it up. I'll still get all my other sprint work done for the week, you know, for the, the sprint. But this will be one other, you know, bit of refactoring that we needed to do anyway, you know, yeah, like really step up. And I'm thinking about the, the last team in particular that, I, that uh, I worked with that was, that was just, it started off toxic and, and it ended, we were, we, you know, we didn't love each other, but we <laughs> yeah. certainly trusted yeah. each other. And that's the most important thing, right? Like you right. don't need the right. love in a team. You need that trust. You need that kind of empathy for one another and kind of that, um, like team spirit. Um, yeah. 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 I, I really, I hope right now, at least one of Zach or Danny or Brian, is listening to this and going, yeah, that was a good team. I only thought of three. There were like 12 of us. <laughs> Everybody else, I'm sorry. Although one of them I know for a fact is not listening to this because that guy, when I transitioned, said, yeah, sorry, I'm not going to be your friend anymore. And I went, fair. Cool. I guess Please. you weren't to begin with. <laughs> no. Right. So. Yeah. Interesting. That brought the room down. Sorry. No, that's okay. <laughs> I mean, I have plenty of stories, like even interrelationship wise. That, oh, um, gosh. Yeah. It's just, uh, unfortunately, there's just not enough understanding yet outside of the community, I think, around, right. you know, like actually 
what we go through in the actual experience rather than, you know, bathrooms and like HRT and whatever they're arguing about in a bill next week. <laughs> yeah. 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 The day to day experience of being the person you are. Yeah, yeah. Is, is what gets completely lost. And, you know, I, OK, I'm going to do it because it's like bathrooms. I mean, is this is this is this really the hill we're going to die on? I mean, I understand there are people who feel uncomfortable, maybe even around me, despite after despite me even having had gender affirming surgery. I understand there are some people. And if you want me to leave the, the bathroom, like I would do it if somebody said, mm, you know what, I'm trying to pee. Can you go? Can you wait? Right. I would actually do that, you know, but to try to like legislate identity where does that go from there? Because I think where it goes is, you know, down. We don't get better when you start legislating one group's identity, because then it's going to be the next group's identity. And and I mean, I'm, you know, I'm going down the, what is that, Godwin's Law? Is that what it yeah, is? It's, it's, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Somehow Hitler's going to be invoked here, but. So it's not Rule 34. I know that much. I think it's Godwin's Law, but. Although there has to be a, at least one person who has invoked Rule 34 right after Godwin's Law, and there's a nude picture of Hitler on the internet. I mean, we can only hope, you know? <laughs> I, yeah. And then <laughs> somebody, somebody wrapped it in an observable, and, and they were off to the races, right? Put a red I, I'm, on I'm it. sure it's an NFT already, you know? <laughs> <laughs> It is, yes. There's some white supremacist NFT out there right now. Yeah. By the way, I can already hear like the death threats on the phone. I don't know how you're feeling right now, but <laughs> that's okay. It's just another day ending in Y, right? <laughs> yeah, right. Right. All right. So let me get off of that because I'm, yeah, I'm actually I'm very interested. So I told you I have some background in drag. Yes. And what that meant when I was in graduate school, when I was in graduate school, by the way, I had the most glorious hair. I mean, this is pretty dang good. It's pretty great. Hair. Yeah. I was going to say, how does that get better? It's, you know, it's not a, it's not a natural color. Mm. You know that, right? Yeah. I, 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 I kind of guessed, but I didn't want to ask, you know? Yeah. No, a lot of people think they just go, well, sure. Purple. Why not? But, um, no, no, it's, it's hair dye, but, but it was, um, about waist length when I was in, uh, yeah. In, in graduate school and it was dyed blue black and, and I was very pale and tragic and had a bunch of rings and a lot of eyeliner and and uh so I was very gothic tragic and, and gothic and I had to do this a lot and so I would so there was a place in town in Athens Georgia where I did drag but it was so different to what I see today and I, partly I'd love to talk about that because my my experience was we all we all wanted to be women, I think is the best way I can put that. It didn't feel like it was an artistic expression. It was it was an expression, mm, gosh, do I want to I was gonna say it was an expression of identity, and I don't know if that's I, that artistic expressions are, so I don't I I think I said that poorly, but I wanted to be a woman then, and the people I knew wanted to be women. It wasn't I want to be a man in drag. Um, how has how have things changed? I'm just going to say because because obviously I'm like the old fogey here. <laughs> I mean, age is just a number. Um, Thank you so much. Anytime. Uh, I think like trans folks have always been embedded in kind of our community within drag, right? It's. It's even if you look at ballroom, the families that have existed in ballroom traditionally have often been run by like trans like women. Um, really? There are a lot of trans houses. Yeah. Like because obviously as queer folks, we're more likely to be kicked out of the house to become homeless. There was obviously this uh, this kind of mag magnet that kind of happened, especially in New York, I think. Um, yeah. Kind of really cement that um and yeah like it's i don't think it's ever stopped i think that now we have the ability to identify our gender dysphoria 
before we kind of get into drag, you know, or yeah. explore that, uh, because it is more commonplace because we talk about it more. Um, right, but still, very true. There's still so many incredible transgender, like, drag artists out there. Um, like, even, like, just locally, there are probably at least, like, five or six of them that you could kind of hit if you went to your local shows on a Friday night. Um yeah. And I think it's just, it, it's a real testament to how important trans folks have been in the community. Um, and unfortunately, n- not necessarily recognized for it all the time. But um, yeah, we're, we're a staple. We need to be uh, recognized for that a little bit. Well, that's for sure. The I guess the, the thing that gets me, so I look at, at some drag artists, and this isn't, Every single one. I don't want to make any universal statement here. Yeah. It seems like um, drag has now come to be associated with like a diva kind of kind of personality and, uh, you know, slap fighting. And I'm, you know, I'm not even sure what else I wanted to say there. But and it, it felt like it was more, I don't know, familial. Is that the word I want to? Not like, but we were only working together 40 hours a week. So not really like a family. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'm sorry, but that actually did feel very familial, though. It was yeah, like, you know, it's very different because because we had, you know, there were people, you know, it was small town Georgia in the U.S. You know, you right. did not have a lot of people doing this. So, so, yeah, that's I, I know, right, right. And I think that was the thing. And I look at um, sometimes I look at some drag artists and I go, am I part of that community? Because I don't I honestly I don't feel like I am. Right. Yeah, and I I can totally see that. I think that drag has changed a lot, even in the last, like, five or ten years, um, Mm -hmm. 16 years at this point since, like, RuPaul's Drag Race started. Um, Wait, 16 years? Is that true? It is true. Oh, my gosh. It's been been out there for a while, and, like, probably – 20 odd Emmys at this point. Um, yeah. Like it, it has become like a staple of TV. It's on MTV now instead of logo, you know? Um, it has like an audience of like at least a million in the States, like on any given oh, I'm episode. Sure. Yeah, um, I'm sure. So that obviously has had a huge impact on drag um, generally and people who are starting drag and the way they start drag and how they think of drag. Um, and that I think has been talked about by some drag drag artists who've been on even drag race um because drag is much more than that it's it's much more than you know um amazing costumes and being able to like do an acting challenge um yes (laughs) there is an art form beyond that um and i think that's also why i'm so passionate about kind of drag me and why i created it because if you if you go to your local kind of bars or your local drag shows i i would bet and i would put good money that they are very similar in community and familial style as you were talking about you know uh back when you were doing drag um it's just that it's it's now kind of become mainstream and there's this mainstream view of it. Um, and what I would love to do and what I would love drag me to do is to really kind of um, highlight more of that local talent, right? Um, more diversity okay. of like art form and drag um, people going to more local shows and kind of getting um, really used to the entire like spectrum of of drag that exists out there instead of just seeing this very narrow tunnel view okay thank you actually that was thank you that helped (laughs) good because i I felt there was no bridge between who i was and i mean i was telling you it was like 1995 i think it was it was almost 30 years ago and I know things have changed. The world has changed yeah. in 30 years. But thank you. I didn't realize there was a bridge. And that bridge is the, the local the local community. I good point. Yeah. So so tell so the purpose of Drag Me. So and also by the way, I do want to point so dragme.io is the uh is the URL for that. It is, yes. Thank and you. We'll have a we'll have a uh, there's a link in the in the show notes. We'll do that. 
it, which by the way, I saw dot IO and I was like, Oh, look at you. You're so tech. Cool. <laughs> Very <laughs> tech. Yeah. <laughs> Very. But, but the purpose is to connect people then on this local level and on much, much more community type level. So yeah. how did you, what, I mean, first of all, let me ask the question. Why did you, why was that important to you? Why did you want to start that? It, it's funny because um, I, I moved to Vancouver now about three years ago. Um, it mm -hmm. was during the tail end of the pandemic. And um, I've always been heavily involved with drag. Like there was a drag artist back in the UK who was on mainstream TV when I was growing up. Um, right. Her name was Lily Savage. Um, the personality actually grew up from my hometown. So this is like an example of a queer person not only like getting out of their town and surviving like puberty yeah. but also like being successful um for me and that's kind of a, what made me fall in love with it was that kind of that hope um that exists there and i think um when i moved to vancouver trying to find that community was incredibly hard um, drag exists on the internet across several different websites. So it's like Eventbrite, Facebook events, Ticketmaster, sure. local yeah. bar websites. It's very hard to find like that kind of full spectrum and kind of landscape of drag that's happening in your area. Um, and so what I wanted to do with Drag Me is kind of really bring that to one place so that um, that local talent that, you know, might struggle for a wider audience at least then has kind of a, a very highly engaged drag loving audience who is using the app um, that they can tap into. But also folks like me can get to go to more shows and get more diversity from the art yeah. form. Yeah. yeah. And, and so this, I mean, it's all community driven, right? I mean, there's not like a you know a central group of people like hey what's going on in dubuque iowa kind of thing right i mean it's it's all community driven too yeah, absolutely so i've got to imagine i'm sorry go ahead and uh yeah i was just gonna say like it's very community driven in the sense that um we've created it like originally i created it obviously from the fan side to get all of those events but when i started doing like my product market fit research because product development nerd um right. <laughs> i i very quickly found out that like drag artists like they have so many tools that they have to use and so many things they have to remember to do to be able to produce their shows at any mm. given time that they really need a central tooling, like a productivity tooling, let's say, um, to see. be able to like run their day-to-day -day small business because that's what it is at this point, right? It's a small business. Interesting. Yeah, it's a good point. Yeah, that's a good – they're like entrepreneurs. Yeah. Just with phenomenal eye makeup, you know. Yes. Phenomenal yes. eye shadow. And the ability to stand in heels for hours at a time, which I could not do. <laughs> I don't know that I could now. I don't own any heels. Yeah. <laughs> at, at the time, I did have some – I think there were three and a half inch heels, which even that is not that tall. But but it so, did make me like 6'2". And... <laughs> nice. Oh, my gosh. No, I – don't generally say that I think I'm an attractive person. When when I was dressed up in graduate school, I was definitely very beautiful. Um, mm. Yeah, it was common. I would go out because this I would do this, you know, just I'm transgender. I don't know if you if I told you that, but I, I had no idea. Thank you for clarifying. Yeah, uh huh. Sure. <laughs> but I would dress up and could just go to bars. Right. And and I was in a college town, a lot of frat boys, uh, you know, fraternity bro boy type thing. And there were many, many nights I didn't spend a dollar, <laughs> you That's know, cool. not, yeah. not Canadian, not U.S. Um, yeah. Because people would just go, hey, honey, what do you want? And I'd say I would always get a Long Island iced tea because classy it's it was the stiffest no it isn't <laughs> but it was the stiffest drink you could get yeah and if i'm not paying for it <laughs> so, right? pay your money's so, worth you know <laughs> yeah you know if you're buying give me the give me the biggest one so yeah, I'm the um, good <laughs> there was some there was somewhere i wanted to go with that i think just to say i don't even know but i did like this walk down memory lane where you know that yeah, was great 
so now you founded a whole company around this. And I've got to tell you, that's that takes some uh, some chutzpah. I'm not actually Jewish, by the way, but it takes <laughs> some chutzpah. To, was that much apparent yeah. too? Was <laughs> in in this political climate, yes, and and financial environment, and it's you know, I'm not sure if you noticed, but like gender transgender issues are kind of big going on right now. So you wanted to found a to a company. That's 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 uh, ambitious. What what drove that? Why why did you have to do that? I think well, I uh, to be fully transparent, I got laid off from my previous role um, with uh, like forty percent of the company like last October. Jeez, oh, okay. It was it was a small startup. Um, it was poorly run, as I mentioned, um, and yeah, it was. It was uh, putting more money into the Toronto office than it wanted to put into its employees. So we ended up getting laid off. I had already kind of been working on Drag Me as a side kind of hustle because I knew I wanted to leave that place anyway that year. Um, And so I kind of just said to myself, I said, this is a sign that I should really put more effort into this and it's something that i should stand behind um so i did it um i have taken kind of out like uh business loans to kind of get to where we are and kind of gone through my retirement um but because i think the political climate is the way that it is i think that that is a more important time to be doing something like this right um if if drag community is being targeted in certain states for just existing, um, having a digital community at least brings some form of safety. And and that's also why we are putting a lot of um, thought behind the verification and validation process as you onboard onto the app, because we want to make sure it's a safe space and and not somewhere that we're going to find hate or, or any kind of like, um, I guess just hurtful content. Mm hmm. Let me just tell you, I, th- I think just thank you. <laughs> I mean, what what respect I have for that answer. Wow. Especially in this political climate, because I would think you go, yeah, I'll keep my head down. But but you're 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 providing an outlet. Um, you're providing continuity. Yeah. And uh, that's powerful. It's very bad. Yeah, I honestly, I blame my therapist. Um, I got <laughs> some self-confidence and was like, yeah, I'm going to bet on me. And so I decided to bet on me. Um, I figured I know me well enough to know that I can make it work. Mm-hmm. So let's do it. Um, and I, I don't regret it at all. And it's been it's been hard, don't get me wrong. Like personally speaking, it's it's been kind of hard to – to do this full time, but it's, it's been worth every second of it. And I wouldn't change it for the world. Pretty much what everybody says about transition, right? Yeah, absolutely. I've been through that. I can be through anything, right? (laughs) You know, what a good point. What a good point. So do do you have an idea how many, uh, about how many um, users are there on, because there are people who want to, watch drag and then there are artists who want to to be in shows how many how many of, of each do you uh do you currently have so right now we're we're actually we just released um in the last couple of days actually and oh, i gosh. know okay. this is going to to kind of air a couple of weeks down the line but um we've just launched kind of our revenue generating model um this cool. week okay cool yeah. um so we do have a list of uh, we had 400 beta kind of users that wanted to test the For app real wow. 400 people signed up um just from organically posting in like drag groups on facebook um yeah. and kind of like putting it on our socials and 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 334 of those people downloaded the app like 
when we kind of launched it as a shell app, um, which it did nothing. Um, and they've like a lot of them have still been active since. So there is a lot of, you know, kind of support from the community behind it, which yeah. is wonderful. We've been able to partner with like Yuriko O'Hara, for instance, as well, um, which has been wonderful. Um, so we do have support. It's just now getting the funding to kind of show folks that the support is there and we can do a lot right. with it. Right. The, the, so the revenue model is some advertising or is it, uh, cause it's no, free no advertising. Artists. So okay. the revenue model is actually based, um, there's, there's two revenue models, um, we will be releasing the transactional fee like on tickets, on merchandise, on kind of purchases. Oh, right, um, sure. Very similar to kind of how t Ticketmaster does it, but a lot mm -hmm. less fees. Um, That's a yeah. low bar. I mean, <laughs> I mean it, yeah, honestly. Um, I think it's like 10 to 23% is usually what folks take off tickets processing Jeez. wise um, and so we decided to go with nine percent for that reason um and we're we're putting those transactional fees on the fan side because if we want to promote local drag if we want to make um local drag and full-time careers in drag like economically viable for people we need to make sure that the artists are saving money in every way that yeah. they can um, right, and right. so that's going to be our main revenue model to start. Um, we will then start to implement things like subscriptions for lower processing fees, uh, pre-order access oh, to yeah. tickets, things like yeah, this. Yeah. Um, um, and so that will be kind of another revenue model that we'll be introducing, I, I would say, probably 2025 at this point. That's super cool. That's great. What's... Um... I don't know how much you can say. What's on the product roadmap? Yeah, so, I mean, for, for the MVP, we're going to have ticket management and event management um, live, as well as the payment processing side of things. Um, the great thing is, as well, we're using Stripe's um, creator economy product, which is in mm -hmm. beta right now. Um, and it allows, essentially, us to allow our artists to sign up for their own mini Stripe accounts, uh, payment processing wise. So sure. every artist that signs up for an account with Drag Me will have their own payment processing account that they will oh, use wow. and yeah. will be able to track their own financials through it. Um, so that's just kind of from the, the, the offset. We'll be adding things like e-commerce. Um, we just launched as well a virtual tipping feature um, which will be very much like Venmo, Cash App, very kind yeah. of instantaneous. Um, so hopefully we'll be able to save some some artists some fees on that that side of things as well. I love that. I would not have thought of that. The virtual tipping. Oh, that's awesome. Because you can just yeah. have somebody now in a in a club going, "Ooh, I liked that one. Five bucks exactly. or whatever." And who carries cash anymore? I certainly don't. Post pandemic. Yeah. No. Pre-pandemic. Even, yeah, to be honest. But now especially. Never, yeah. I've never liked carrying change, you know. No. You're like, why do I have a pocket full of pennies? No. Am I, I going to be able to do anything with this? Yeah. I have a card or whatever, yeah. you know. Exactly. I mean, I guess Apple. I suppose I could do that. Um, I'm older school. And so I, so first of all, I've got my, my Android phone, first of all, which yeah. incidentally, I'm just going to show. I've got Sailor. Is it going to show? I've got a Sailor Moon sticker on there. Because, you know, that's how much I love Sailor Moon. Also, by the way, everybody out there, you are beautiful. Just true. remember that. It's very yep. true. Um, see, that was one of those tangents that I told you that would come out and then it'd be like derail everything. Uh, anyway, the the tipping, I think that's, I think all of those are amazing. I love the, I love the roadmap. I love how, I mean, I got to tell you, when I first saw this, I thought, oh, I don't know. I mean, do we need to promote some of the kind of weird diva stuff i'm 100 percent turned around and you didn't have to sell me because you're such a nice person anyway it's not like you had to sell me <laughs> but like you know i'm sort of like gosh maybe i should go and see a couple of shows now because I, yeah. I you know it used to be it used to be a love and and uh i don't know it's really i think rupaul's drag race that that, that sort of soured it, it a little it did in a lot of ways. I mean, it's I, I'm infinitely grateful for it because um, I think it was like 2020, the first year of the pandemic, 
drag related content grew by 600 percent on wow wine. like yeah, streaming wow. um yeah and so rupaul's drag race is very much behind a lot of the kind of mainstream push of drag now um, yeah. which is a good and a bad thing in certain ways but it does mean that we have more queer folks who are experimenting with drag um who are kind of growing up locally and um going to want to be able to to kind of perform um and so being able to give them that ability and being able to give fans like myself the ability to see a wider range of drag i think is only going to help the community versus you know kind yeah. of that narrow view of diva like uh behavior like you say right and i don't i don't remember if it was in this conversation or if it was before we before we started talking you know the more the more people see just you know the lgbtq community just period the queer just queerness period i think the better you know, ultimately, we just end up integrating into, I hate to call it normal, but, you know, we become normal. And and it's fascinating to me that, that we got pushed out and now we have to sort of elbow our way back in. Because this wasn't, it's not always been like this. No, no, very much not. Um, and I mean, like, drag has, like I said, always been cemented in, in our community, like, mm -hmm. as, as of trans folks. Um, and a lot of trans sure. folks were doing drag back then as well. Um, and so I think being able to kind of keep that with in ourselves as a, a kind of outlet and a way to perform and make money, potentially, um, is great, but also being able to bring in more folks from outside our community to be able to see, you know, like we are artists, we we are creative, we are human, we are, you know, everything along the the spectrum uh, that you can yeah. imagine. Um, yes. And normalizing that, I think, and normalizing the experimentation with one's gender, I think, is is nothing but a good thing. Um, right. Speaking from my perspective and not realizing how trans I was until I was way into my 20s. Um, yeah. You know, it's, it's great that that is more of commonplace now, I think. Oh, wholeheartedly agree. Wholeheartedly agree. Yeah, more, the more, I think the more we explore our identities, the the better humanity becomes. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. I, I mean, I could stick a period at the end of that. You know, the, the more we know who we are, the better we end up being. Yeah. So, and, and now I, what I think we face is a lot of fear to express who we are because, you know, there's this pressure not to be too different. Yeah. And it, which, okay, another tangent. Because <laughs> I can remember being in like, the seventies, the eighties, you know, and I was younger, obviously, you know, as you know, but I can remember like punk when punk was, was, you know, becoming a thing when goth became a, you know, was a thing as well. And those two were sort of intertwined, but, and then when, you know, you had, uh, the grunge coming in and the raver community, which I realize we don't call it that anymore, but you know, this is how old I am. Like that was okay. Like all of those were okay. They were just kind of fashion-y type things that people went, yeah, it's cool. Look, there's a there's one of those people across the street, whatever. And it was kind of welcomed. And it seems like now I walk down the street and people go, ooh, I don't think I can take yeah. this. It's a different person. I think that says a lot about the societal norms that we have instilled as like mm -hmm. not only a Western world, but a late stage right. capitalist Western world. Um, yes, it helps. It hurts. The, the kind of solidification of gender roles in, in the media growing up definitely had a profound effect on me, as I'm sure it did with you and everyone oh, yeah. else who's listening to this. Um and I think it's only really now that we're starting to shake away from that a little bit. Um, and that's what's freeing people up to, I think, experiment a little bit more with their gender, yeah. which is yeah. great. Um, but unfortunately, we, we, we didn't have that. Um, I wish we did, but we, we yeah. still have this uh, very much this uh, expectation that, you know, 
women are soft and feminine and men are hard and strong and, um, you know, the provider, at least in right. the cis tech community, for sure. Um, right. And I, I think the more that we kind of realize that people are just people, doesn't really matter where on the spectrum of gender or sexuality or you know race or anything that they're on um it's at least for me about like a person's vibe that i connect with versus like what they look like or what their gender is uh, right yeah i'm all with you i'm all with you so we i've really i can't believe we've actually been talking almost an hour <laughs> um as little as I want to do this, I guess, can can you tell us, um, tell us where we can find Elsa Blair on the internet and especially drag me? So both. Yeah, absolutely. So for, for myself, um, my website is ailsamblair.com. So it's A-I-L-S-A-M-Blair.com. Um, and for drag me, um, as you so kindly mentioned earlier, it is dragme.io um, for the techie in me. You can also get to it through uh, dragmeapp.com. Um, and it is available on the App Store now. So feel free to check it out. And um, we're on socials as dragme.io. So look us up and tell, tell us what you think of your first drag show. For sure. Okay. Cause I, so let's see, I've got your LinkedIn, your Instagram as links yes. and also Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok for drag me as well. Yes. So, correct. All right. Cool. By the way, I was going to mention earlier and I totally forgot did my, uh, my personal website, amethysta.io. So nice. Do you know why though? Why? Because amethysta.com was taken. That's also why it's dragme.io if we don't tell Is it you. okay? Yeah. <laughs> I actually, I reached out to the people who have amethysta.com and they're like, yeah, we'll totally sell it to you. You know, $3,000. And I went, oh no, honey, no. I said, I'll, I'll give you, I'll give you 500. And they said, no, 3,000. And I said, I'll give you 500. And they said, no, 3,000. I went, amethysta.io yeah i said listen i have a cooler website i don't even need a dot com i mean i already got a dot io yeah I know. Dot, dot io is the future <laughs> yeah completely completely i mean it could have been drag me dot gg right i mean it could have been a gamer kind of thing but... yeah it could have been um yeah absolutely it could have been something like uh i believe you can get a dot me uh website so drag yes. dot me would have oh. been pretty great <laughs> God, that would have been. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Did you I, now we're gonna have to go to, we're gonna taken. have to go like, <laughs> Damn. Oh, that's a shame. That's a big shame, but yeah. it would have been great. I know I was really hoping I could find like amethyst.ta, you know. Yeah, yeah. But like there's no dot TA probably for you know obvious reasons, you know. Yeah. Unfortunately. Um, <laughs> there were a few, there were many that I was hoping I could get and I couldn't, you know, dot TA, dot STA. You know, I think there's a dot STD, which I don't know if that would have been more appropriate. I don't know. I mean, it wouldn't be my early. choice for a website, but um, <laughs> you do you, boo, you know? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. Yeah, I can't. It wouldn't be my choice, my first choice either. So, <clears throat> all right. Um, Ailsa, I just want to say thank you so much. I, I have really appreciated all of your openness. I mean, there's a lot of vulnerability that, that you, that you gifted me with today. So thank you so much. Yeah, of course. And thank you for having me. It's been, it's been great kind of meeting you and, and getting to chat a little bit and uh, dive into the infinite world of gender. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. There's so much, so much. Um, shoot. Well, I guess I'll do my little standard ending then every it's funny. Every time I go into the standard ending, this is me delaying by the yeah. way, so I can keep okay. talking to you. <laughs> Every time I do the standard ending, um, I always sound like that. I go, well, okay. <laughs> so it's always just terrible to, to hang up. Yeah. Well, for most people, most people, there are some people I go, yeah, that's fine. Okay. Anyway. Yeah. Bye. <laughs> yeah. Like the person you were telling me about earlier. Yes. No, 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 he, no, he warmed up. He was great. Okay, he was great, great by the end. It was great by the end. At the beginning, it was a challenge, but there you go. 
I still communicate with the guy a little bit. You That's know. awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, one of the very first people I ever interviewed was like early 2023, I think. Wow. Yeah. Something like that. So anyway, nice. sorry. You're fine. Um, yeah, right. All right. So my name is Amethyst Deherrick. I've been speaking with Ailsa Blair on Gender Identity Weekly, and we've been talking about drag and uh, the technology industry and the vibes that we connect with. I took that from you. <laughs> so thank you again to our listeners, and thank you, Ailsa. Mm, thank you. <laughs>